Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the uh, third session of day two of State of the Map 2020 online conference and of the academic track. Uh, in case you weren't, didn't join the first two uh, sessions of the academic track, so uh, this is a track uh, dedicated to um, um, academic research about and with OpenStreetMap. Um, it's the first, third edition of the track. We had two successful ones over the last to um, state of the maps, and now we have the first virtual one. Um, so if you want to know more about uh, academic activity with OpenStreetMap, you're welcome to join the OSM Science mailing list. Um, also, uh, if you want to know more about uh, the talks that we that are included in the track to, tracks today, um, you can, um, go to uh, our proceedings uh, collection, which uh, includes extended abstracts describing each talk. Um, it's available open access on, on Zenodo, just Google State of the Map 2020 proceedings and you'll get there. And you can read, uh, uh, you can read about each talk that we had, if you missed it, if, if you want to know about a bit more. Um, if that's your first State of the Map session, um, I'll briefly talk about how this works. Um, so um, you, if you, I'll start with introducing uh, our speaker in a, in a minute, then we'll watch together the talk and afterwards we'll have a Q and A session. So if you want to post questions uh, during the talk, uh, you need to go to the session pad. Um, so just go to uh, the State of the Map website, Click on the program, scroll down to uh, the talk you are interested in. In this case, this one towards understanding the quality of OpenStreetMap contributions, result of an intrinsic quality assessment of data from Mozambique. Click on it, and on the left side, left hand side, you will have the link to the session pad where you can um, add any question you want or comments. Um, please uh, 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 add your names so we can, uh, uh, well, it's more, more polite. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, with that, we can move to uh, introducing our speaker. Um, so our speaker is Piwe. Uh, she's a final year master's student at the University of Pretoria. Um, her fascination for both geography and information technologies that led to her pursuing a career in geospatial big data science. As a data scientist, she gets to incorporate into her work and studies her passion for geography and the world around her, and the analysis of large amounts of data in order to extract knowledge and insight. And insights. And as we've seen, uh, she's going to talk about Mapper's behavior today and how you can use that to assess the quality of the data. So um, let's let's hear hear all about it. Good day. My name is Apiwa Matubidube. I am a master's student at the University of Pretoria. And today I will be speaking about my research project, which focuses on understanding the quality of OpenStreetMap contributions in Mozambique through an intrinsic quality assessment approach. Projects such as OpenStreetMap have made it possible for anyone to contribute geographic information, regardless of their level of exp expertise or skills. Since the task of creating geographic information is no longer exclusively performed by trained professionals, data quality can be a concern and has often been cited as a hindrance when it comes to the use of this type of data. However, Data generated through crowdsourcing projects such as OpenStreetMap can be a valuable resource for various applications and it can help to fill data gaps. OpenStreetMap data has showcased its importance for various use cases, such as in the case of disaster scenarios, to aid with disaster management and emergency response, and even with mapping vulnerable communities. And in developing countries where spatial data is not always available in some areas, 
crowdsourced geospatial data can be an essential resource. Therefore, this kind of geospatial data has showcased its importance, especially in the case of developing countries and helping to fill data gaps. For example, the value of OpenStreetMap data was recently witnessed in the case of Mozambique, a country in Southern Africa, which was devastated by cyclones Adai and Kenneth in early 2019. Mozambique then received a significant amount of attention in the OSM community following the floods and damages that were caused by these cyclones. OSM volunteers banded together to generate data that would assist to satisfy the informational needs of disaster relief services. OSM data quality has been the focus of many research projects. More and more studies have worked on gaining a better understanding of the quality of the data produced by OSM contributors. And this has mostly been done by comparing OSM data with reference data sets. This is often referred to as extrinsic quality assessment. However, this approach of using external data is not always possible due to limitations that are associated with the acquisition and use of reference data sets. Th these limitations relating to the use of reference data are especially applicable in the case of developing countries, as developing countries are often faced with a lack of spatial data due to various economical as well as technological constraints. So in the current study, we decided to use an intrinsic approach in order to assess OSM data. We examined history data in order to determine how contributors have contributed over time in Mozambique. We believe that knowledge about the contribution characteristics of a community could provide a better understanding of the data that is contributed in that area and help to build insight about data quality. So we essentially want to know how this type of analysis could help with better understanding the state of OSM data in Mozambique. So the task of characterizing OSM contributors consisted of three steps. First, OSM history data was downloaded and used to extract information about individual contributors. Next, this information was used to classify contributors through cluster analysis. And based on this cluster solution, OSM contributors were then characterized. So OSM history data provides a record of all edits or changes that have been performed on OSM by contributors. These, e these edits result in an increment in a feature's version number. Each version of a feature is associated with a contributor or a user as it is referred to in the OSM metadata. And here we have an example of the history records for a node with three versions. It has been edited by three unique contributors, as can be seen by the user IDs. So this kind of history information can be used to create contributor focused data, which would describe the actions of each individual contributor. As we can see here, an example of this contributor focused information which describes how someone has contributed over time is witnessed. For example, here we see three unique contributors and their contribution attributes, such as the date of their first contribution, their, their latest contribution on how many days they made contributions within this time span and the total number of their contributions. So other attributes were also determined as well for each contributor. For example, of the total number of contributions, how many were node contributions, how many were relation contributions, how many were weight contributions, and how many were creations, modifications, or deletions. And another example would be the number of contributions where the user was the last contributor meaning they were associated with the very last version of an OSM feature. 
And this analysis resulted in a little over 10,000 unique contributors for Mozambique. So this contributor-focused information was then used for the clustering process. The particular algorithm used was k-means. K-means clustering is a method that groups a set of data points into a k-number of clusters based on their attributes. The k-means clustering algorithm requires that the number of clusters be specified prior to clustering. And this can be done in a number of ways. For this study, we used the ALGO method. And based on this method, four clusters were determined to be the optimal number of clusters for the contributor focus data in Mozambique. This method uses the within cluster sum of squares or the distance between, or the distance between points in a cluster to determine an optimal number of clusters for the data set. But before contributors could be classified, or um, before this contributed data could be used for cluster analysis, some data pre-processing was necessary. First, feature scaling was applied. Feature scaling is the process of normalizing the data in order to ensure attributes are on the same scale. This was done because k-means is a distance-based machine learning algorithm, which means it can be affected by scale. And the second form of pre-processing was principal component analysis, which is a dimensionality reduction technique. Dimensionality reduction was applied to help make the interpretation of and visualization of the results simpler and to reduce the computation time of clustering. So an iterative process was used in order to determine how many principal components would be beneficial for the clustering algorithm. Various principal component solutions were used for cluster analysis and then they were visualized as can be seen in, the, in this image. As we can see from the very first image, the first three principal components help the clustering algorithm to differentiate between the four clusters. So the first three principal components provide information that helps differentiate between the clusters. However, as we added more principal components, they did not provide much information that helped with differentiating between clusters. So ultimately, a three principal component cluster, so a three principal component solution was chosen to describe the contribution attributes for each user. These principal component values were then used for the clustering process. This table summarizes the final cluster, the final cluster solution and displays the number of contributors that are associated with each cluster. So the k-means clustering algorithm classified each contributor into one of four clusters based on three principal component values that were used to explain each contributor. So the clustering algorithm divided the contributors in Mozambique into four groups based on how they had essentially contributed over time in the area. So we went back to the original data set of attributes. And in order to better understand the clusters that had been produced, some statistics were then calculated. So the average number of mapping days, change sets, as well as total contributions were determined for each cluster. And from these results, we can see that cluster four is the easiest to pick out as it has the highest averages. So we can immediately see that this cluster represents the most active contributors. So this was essentially the easiest cluster to characterize. Upon further inspection of the data, we came to the following conclusions about the remaining clusters. Cluster one appears to mostly consist of contributors that have older contributions and who have not continued to contribute data over time. These contributors have a low number of mapping days as well as a low number of total contributions. So this cluster appears to represent non-recurring contributors. Cluster two, consists of contributors 
who have not been very productive during their time on OpenStreetMap. So these contributors mostly have a low number of change sets and total contributions. And even contributors in this cluster with more mapping days do not have many contributions. So the contributors in this cluster appear to be the least productive on average. And we can see this because the average number of change sets as well as the average number of contributions is the lowest for cluster two. Cluster three consists of contributors who have been, east, who have been active recently. So this could represent newcomers perhaps because these contributors do not have very many mapping days, but they have the second highest number of OSM features where they have been classified as the last contributor. And this is second, of course, to the cluster four. So cluster three and cluster four appear to be the clusters that are associated mostly with the latest version of OSM features. So the results appear to show us that most of the work is done by a small percentage of contributors, which is mainly cluster four. Cluster four accounts for about only a quarter of the total contributors, but about 93% of all contributions are associated with this cluster followed by about 5% of the remaining contributions are associated with contributors from cluster three, which is the newcomers. This makes up 98% of all contributions. While the remaining clusters, which are cluster one and two, have almost no impact. So, so these results are in line with the participation inequality that has often been witnessed with OSM communities. We also see that the resulting clusters could have been influenced by the recent disaster mapping efforts. For example, cluster four, which is the most active set of contributors, does not only have long-term contributors, but they are also contributors with just a few mapping days, but a high number of contributions. This can mostly be seen during the disaster activation mapping period in early 2019. So some contributors have managed to produce thousands of contributions in a short span of time. This pattern is also witnessed with cluster three, which is the cluster of newcomers and the second most active cluster. This cluster seems to be made up of mostly recent contributors and some of the contributors in this cluster are most probably a result of the recent activation mapping efforts. What we can also say is that OSM data in Mozambique appears to still be in the early stages of development. Most areas have been mapped, have not been mapped in detail. And so it appears that volunteers have focused on building a base map. So what kind of questions could this type of analysis help us to answer? Well, it could give us information about the progression of OSM data in an area. For example, what kind of contributors have worked on specific OSM features in that area? Is it newcomers or is it experienced contributors? And this could help with identifying areas that might need to be validated or even updated. So it could help with identifying stale data, where for example, the last known contributor was a non-recurring contributor who has not been active for a long time. So in conclusion, the results of the study show how one can gain a better understanding of the community that tends to contribute by inspecting history data. And this can help with building insight about data quality and help to identify areas that might need data validation. Thank you. Thank
Okay, we're about to go live. Wait for Manfred Hughes. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Let's get us some some uh, interest in the question pad. So, uh, Godwin, please lead the Q and A section. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Godwin. And um, and uh, I'm co-chairing this session with uh, with the R, and so I will um, take over the uh, moderation of the of the Q and A. Um, I've seen several um, interesting uh, questions coming up. Um, first of all, thank you very much, um, Happy Way, for the excellent presentation. And I can see uh, you have had um, um, a lot of people have had uh, interest in this study, and uh, I, I can see about 23 people um, in attendance. Oh, it was 23; it's now 22. Um, so um, there are some comments here. I'll start with the comments um, from one from uh, Yagura Station. He says, um, he or she says, uh, "Wow, awesome work." Um, the other says. Um, there's no name here. Um, really interesting analysis based upon the clustering of users. It reflects other studies I have seen from other uh, other studies with key contributors adding much data. Um, I have my own questions, but I think uh, depending on time, um, I will go through the ones on the session part. So there's one from uh, Cameroon, Cameroon Green, and he, he's asking, how would your uh, results differ uh, when compared to other well-mapped areas in Africa, such as uh, Tanzania? And I think this is related to um, probably in my mind what you uh, talked about in terms of the participation in quality and other aspects. So probably I'll leave it to you, Apiwe, to um, address this question. Um. Thank you, Godwin. And uh, first of all, thank you for um, to everyone who actually tuned in and listened. And thanks for the interesting questions. So um, to get back to this question, I think um, what is different about what I've witnessed anyway in Mozambique is that um, most areas have not been mapped in detail, as I said. So it's basically the base map that volunteers have um, aimed to um, finish. So um, as I mentioned, there's only one to two versions of most features, which I think differs in terms of some other places are better mapped where there is more detail in other countries or other places. But um, since we did not perhaps um, analyze a smaller portion or maybe where um, youth mappers or some or some mappers have been focused in Mozambique, maybe we would have seen a different pattern. But since we took the whole country, I think this just shows that the state of development in terms of mapping is still at quite a new, at quite a new stage. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think, yeah, this will set the stage for further comparative studies uh, regarding uh, this question. Um, the next question um, is about which technique do you think is most um, useful to help in the uh, intrinsic um, intrinsic studies? Um, I think you, may, you I think your study was about k-means and others. So um, I think this guy is uh, pointing to PCA. I think principal component analysis and things like that. Um, so um, what do you think about that? Um, I think a combination because I use a combination of them both. Uh, principal components analysis as well as k-means clustering but the pca was more so to narrow down the variables to their principal components so it could be easier to understand what what each cluster represented because if we went with all of the 20 or so variables it was going to be harder to explain what each of the clusters represented so i think a combination of actually um all the analysis techniques that were used I think they all played a part in the final results. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, another question from Greg Rose. Was there an, uh, an effort to plot cluster member, um, cluster member mapping against automated error findings such as uh, keep right or osmos, um, osmos or something like that? I don't know whether you're aware of these, these terms. 
and that is to find errors uh, in mapping uh, tied to specific clusters. Anyway, he says, great job. Please address. Uh, no, um, I don't think the study really um, actually did that. So okay. uh, yeah, we didn't make an effort to do that. Yeah, probably a good idea for future work. Yes, I would say so. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Greg, also for the question. Um, the next question um, is about, um, I think it's from um, Adi Orden, um, the uh, uh, previous present, one of the previous presenters. Um, did you try out other clustering methods aside from uh, k-means? Uh, interesting, it's like Adi read my mind because I have this question here. <laughs> uh, can you explain more about your, um, uh, your reasoning uh, for using a parametric-based um, clustering method over a density-based uh, clustering method? Um, well, oh, okay. Um, I actually did not. Um, we actually didn't try um, other clustering methods. And honestly, to say it's because um, k-means was the clustering method that I was um, most knowledgeable, knowledgeable about and familiar with. And since it is such a simple, um, it's simpler to understand, um, this is the clustering method I, I went with. I think um, it would need a bit more in-depth knowledge to perhaps try um, other clustering methods. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, also, I think there's no, uh, oh, thank you, Adi, also for that. Um, the last question um, on the part is, uh, will you be continuing with this study or is the project now complete? I think it is, um, well, from my side, I would say it's not complete. Um, I think there could be potential for future work, but um, I'm not sure yet whether I would choose to continue with the study, but I think it has um, unveiled some interesting things that could be looked at in terms of future work, because um, in terms of looking at Mozambique, we say that um, most of the work is done by the most active contributors, and we assume that these contributors um, actually contribute good information, but this is mostly based on assumption that other papers have also said that we assume that someone who's experienced has good um, good contributions, but this um, hypothesis has not been tested. So I think future work could also look in testing. Um, could we see a difference from data contributions of newcomers versus experienced contributors? And um, is this actually a valid um, is this a, a valid assumption to make? Then this would be um, um, it would be more justified to say that experienced contributors actually contribute good information once we've actually looked more into this. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much. I think we still have some time, so I will uh, jump into some of the questions I have myself. Um, oh no, I think there is another one here uh, on the part. Um, so that uh, um, is, is about spatial data. It is from Stefan, Stefan, uh, if you're German. Um, spatial, uh, spatial data quality has five elements according to a certain, I think a certain link. I've not gone there yet, but the question is, on what data quality element are you after? Completeness or something else? Accuracy, positional, uh, thematic accuracies, uh, positional accuracies, all sort of completeness indicators also and other indicators, so indicators of quality. So which one are you really um, interested in? Um, I think that is based on a case-to-case -case basis. Here we were more so looking at intrinsic quality mm -hmm. measures. So those are, um, those quality measures that are, were just mentioned are more so used when you are using reference data and you using extrinsic or um, external data to compare what is happening. So I think, um, that is more on a case-to-case -case basis. If you were to further um, decide what kind of uh, quality you'd want to assess in Mozambique, then you could choose based on um, those specific elements. Um, as I said, in future work, if you were to actually assess the data and see, um, does this actually correspond that experienced contributors um, contribute good information, then you could perhaps start to decide um, would we want to look at completeness or would you want to look at thematic accuracy and so forth? But with intrinsic quality assessment, I think it's more of a basic statement. 
to say we assume because these people are knowledgeable with OpenStreetMap that they know what they're doing. Excellent, brilliant. I think the way you put it actually even sparkled another question in my mind. That is about um, uh, experience. So you said, um, so I'm thinking about what, when you say experienced mappers, what do you, what do you have in mind uh, from your study and also generally? Uh, um, I would say with experienced mappers from my study and in general is uh, people who, first of all, have experience with contributing in general in OSM. So, but we only looked at Mozambique, so we can only speak for their contributions in Mozambique. So, for example, people who have at least um, some practice with contributing, whether it be um, a week, but it's not... Um, uh, it's not a week in terms of they only contributed within one week, but their days add up to, let's say, seven days. Or some people even um, have a hundred and something days split um, that have been um, split over years, for example. So I think experience is how much you've been practicing and how much you know about contributing towards the OSM project. That is um, what experience is. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have another question here. Um, it was interesting to hear about the concept of uh, participation um, uh, inequality, and um, I was wondering, what do you think about um, um, what do you think um, OSM community can do uh, to increase participation? Um, I think raise awareness as well, perhaps because I think this is a bit of a tricky question because this whole participation inequality thing is not only witnessed in Mozambique, but in terms of um, other online communities as well, where um, it's mostly up to people, the most interested group, and just a small number of people who are interested in actually furthering the data and contributing. So um, I think things like um, trying to reach out to the community and making them understand why this type of mapping is taking place would help sort of uh, uh, reach more people who would perhaps be interested in um, mapping. But this is also a research question as to why people keep mapping versus why people, some people only map for a few days, maybe even a day, then they decide, hey, I'm done, I'm not gonna map anymore. So it, I think that is also a research question of its own as to um, why are they dedicated mappers versus people who don't continue mapping over time? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, you could even look into, you know, the participation as to volunteer participation and then also paid or uh, commercial participation in a way. Um, anyway, thanks a lot uh, for that. Um, so I have another one here uh, regarding the uh, contribution, uh, the analysis regarding con the contributors. So did you consider the time of uh, registration by contributors to join um, OpenStreetMap? Uh, no, actually. Um, I think since we only looked at data that um, concerned the Mozambique area, so we looked at how long they've been contributing in that specific area, but we did not um, look at uh, how long the user has actually been registered, which is, I would say, a weakness of the study, for um, example, because people who are considered newcomers in Mozambique might not necessarily be newcomers to the OpenStreetMap project. I think that would need um, analysis of the whole database, which is um, quite intensive and would need definitely more computing power. Uh, brilliant. I think in your case, the newcomers was in terms of the uh, mapping days, isn't it? Y yes. Yeah. And also um, um, how, because local mappers might know more about Mozambique versus people who uh, who haven't mapped there before. So you could say they're just newcomers in Mozambique in terms of they've never mapped that area. So they know less, they might know less about it. I see. Brilliant. Um, I saw also the, I think in terms of uh, the temporal analysis, you looked at, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you looked at uh, 2016 to 2019, right? Yes. And I was um, wondering why, why this period? Uh, okay. Well, this is because um, in terms of the history data, the history data has um, a record of all the contributions that have been made in Mozambique. And the first ever contribution that we could track from the history data was in 2006. So that is um, how we determined the, um, the first date. It's from the first ever contribution. And then um, 2019, why we decided to 
we looked until I think about mid-2019, which is when I extracted the data and started the analysis. So this was also influenced by the recent um, disaster scenarios that happened where we wanted to see how this also influences um, the mapping patterns. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I have another here. I think I was thinking about the K-means clustering and uh, your definition of distance here. And um, what when you say distance, what do you mean exactly? Um, as far as I know, K-means clustering uses um, Euclidean distance. Brilliant. If I'm not mistaken, yes. OK, brilliant. Thanks a lot. And I was wondering you know, the, whether um, uh, it's possible also to consider um, you know, the network distance. Uh, because it's not always the case that you know um, where you have the validated um, um, road network, you know, then you could use the distance as a, as an input to the to the algorithm to sort of compute um, the clusters. I don't know whether uh, this came to mind or you considered that. I have to say I did not consider it. I think that would also need more research in terms of figuring out um, how this different distance measures would um, affect k-means because um, Euclidean distance is sort of the default that is used, but I'm not sure whether you can actually choose to use different distance measures. So that would need further research. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I think the, I have one last question. Uh, I think we don't have any more, so I'll just ask this last question. Um, you're almost there. Um, so the issue is about, uh, I think the general one, which is about the, your experience about working with uh, history data, or some history data. Um, what sort of challenges did you find uh, in terms of you know, extracting it, analyzing it, and to getting the results that you presented nicely to us? Um, I would say it's definitely um, a lot of data to work with. So you would um, need a lot of computing power because I only worked with Mozambique data. So I can only imagine if you would be tasked with um, having to work with, for instance, the whole OpenStreetMap database, if you were interested in the whole user, co um, the whole contributing community. So um, analysis did take quite some time because of, the, because of how much data um, was involved. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent presentation. Um, I've learned a lot, and I hope all of you who are uh, listening have also learned a lot. Um, and thank you all. Um, this will come to a close, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.